give me the um, you can give me the um, screen. And um, so this is our uh, Rachel might count differently about this. I think Rachel said this is our eleventh. Is this our eleventh? Is that what you said? Uh, community practice. I think so. Yeah. Yes. Which is I very think fantastic. So. We are um, very, very excited, and um, we, we're we going to start with inter introductions, and um, this is a, another exciting session, uh, and as always, we give, we're give we giving everyone an update of our uh, URL, the website that has all of the exciting community practice um, past presentations, as well as all of the data to action training materials, which we also continue to iterate. We just updated some week from our NHSBC presentation. Um, and then also, um, this, we always have a research update. Uh, and so we're going to do uh, the URL connection and the research update. And we are also going to um, hear our main uh, speaker, Jason Rodriguez, is going to walk through a very exciting modeling fra framework with data that uh, will, I think everyone will find useful. Um, but let's start with introductions. Um, uh, I don't know how to do this, so um, I, I'm looking at some names. Uh, how about we go, we'll see who's here from Utah, because I see D here. Yeah, this is D Norton. I work for The Road Home here in Salt Lake City, Utah. Good to hear you, D. And uh, Mark, I, I don't, Mark is on also? Mark DeHaunt. Maybe you're on mute, Mark. It looks like he was um, coming and going a couple times. Might be some te technical difficulty. Okay. And Marley Williams? She's showing as self muted right now. Okay. Marley's, I think, with San Diego, which is great. Great to have you on. Um, looks like uh, also Mark's with San Diego. That's fantastic. And um, Melissa, I see you're on. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, Melissa Wall, I work with uh, CHIP and the Indianapolis Immigration Project. Great. And Sarah? Hi, this is Sarah Khan with Cloudburst. And there's a, um, a caller unknown. Who else is on the call? The secret admirer. So good. We like these. Okay. And uh, other people may be joining us as we go. Um, but let's go ahead and kick it off. We um, had a very good, uh, I don't know whose screen you're looking at. What screen can people see right now? I think uh, I have the screen, Jamie. Oh, good. Rachel. Rachel has it. Rachel has it. Good. Okay, good. Because, Rachel, you're going to be doing the first part. So, um, we had a lot of sessions last week going on in National NHSBC, a lot going on. Um, but one of, the, one of the sessions that we did do was a compressed form of the um, data to action training, uh, which is a really great uh, training for those who haven't seen it. Uh, but it was also um, a really great opportunity to update uh, our uh, URL with some new um, attachments. And so Rachel's just going to uh, go through a quick uh, focus, I think, on one utility of the dashboard and a quick overview again uh, to remind us it's there and these resources continue to expand. Rachel? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Jamie. I'm actually not going to touch on the brand new stuff today. We're going to touch on that next month. Um, Jamie's actually developed some really interesting adaptations of the data storytelling and expanded that into a whole system-wide data communications uh, PowerPoint. So we'll go through that more next month. But I just wanted to highlight some aspects of the website each month when we have our calls so that we remember um, the various tools and resources that are there. So I thought that I would highlight the secondary data tools this time. So if you're on the website, this is just a screenshot of the home page, and then you click on the D2A training, one of the options that comes up is this module five, which is data interpret oops, 
we jumped ahead there, data interpretation and guidance using secondary data. And on the sidebar here, I put the link directly to the secondary, secondary data section just for everyone's um, use afterwards. So down at the bottom of the page here, you'll notice this blue hyperlink to secondary data sources. And when you click on that, it actually will open a, a Word document that's this amazing secondary data sources um, worksheet that Jamie and Cloudburst have developed. So it's really well organized by secondary data type um, and subject matter. So you've got numerous um, secondary data websites related to homeless, HUD homeless data, various HUD reports, um, housing inventory count, HIT and HIC data, uh, homeless reports. And then the next section is health data, which is really great if you're trying to round out some of your homeless data with broader public health indicators from your county or your state level. And then the next section down is beho behavioral health data with a number of resources. Um, housing and poverty data, which one of which I'm going to open up as an example. And then there's also two more pages here with housing and poverty data continued. Um, something here, the state of the nation's housing that Jamie's going to explore with you next. And then also census, poverty, labor and education data, which may be useful for various reports to funders or grantors or grantees. So just important to remember these secondary data sources are here because they're really invaluable and uh, can be used in a, in a broad range of ways. So I thought I would just click on one, and I picked this National Low Income Housing Coalition out of reach, because I really enjoyed um, learning about how they framed um, some of the issues and the wage gap, which I found quite shocking, between what the hourly wage you need to earn in various states in order to be able to afford an apartment. So they present this really great map by state, and then you can also um, click on your state here. So I live in Connecticut, so I'll click on Connecticut. And then it tells you, you know, Connecticut's got the ninth highest housing wages and you need 20, almost $25 an hour in order to afford a two bedroom um, unit. And you would need to work 99 hours a week at minimum wage to afford a two bedroom unit, which is, you know, completely ridiculous and unsustainable. But there's really interesting data by state and a variety of um, you know, media kits, graphics, reports, um, and uh, more detailed things that you can explore. And each of the resources on this, mic on this Word document is similarly complex and really exciting. It presents data in a, you know, a great story and this dashboard here. So some, you know, for presentations or other things you might want to use, it's just, you know, sometimes important to remember that we do have all these other resources that go beyond, above and beyond the HMIS data. So I just wanted to highlight that today for you. Okay. Yeah, that's great. And my favorite one of all the secondary data sets is really the eviction um, lab data set. There's a link in there. And I just also I highly recommend you go to that. Um, it, that data, that, that's Matthew Desmond's work on eviction, which I think most of us heard about. But that website is so well designed out of Princeton, both in the data they collect on evictions across the country, but also in how they allow you to design what other data you want to compare it to, what other sites, you could see two other sites, and then you can go back once those are loaded, and that whatever they've been showing you, they will actually uh, fill in a PowerPoint. So the presentation's ready made for you to go to your stakeholders and present on the eviction data in your own area. Tied to this other, I mean, it's very, very complex, right? And eviction's one part of homelessness. It's really important for us to understand. But you can use that PowerPoint and you could add another slide, like what we're gonna uh, look at from um, the State of the Nation's Housing. Uh, but it's having this data both visible for us to see and then downloadable to quickly create into a stakeholder engagement PowerPoint, brilliant, just beyond brilliant. So Rachel speaking of state and the, um, you can actually get a sense of this uh, and there's a place to uh, go down view more data. Oh, look at that. It's getting close to my hometown over there. Where, where Nagasak is on evictions. And then you can see, you can pick another location, another location, you scroll down, keep going down. 
Um, it said that those other locations you probably would pick, a, like there's a state of Massachusetts, you might pick the country and you might pick a, a, a city, or you might pick all three comparable cities. Um, and then it's gonna show you those rates, comparable rates uh, to look at. And then if you scroll down farther, it should show you uh, the link where you go see download reports. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. And this is beautifully done PowerPoint, like right there automated. Uh, you can get the data in Excel. You can also get it as a PowerPoint, which I highly recommend. Wow. Thanks, Rachel, for going there. And <laughs> But then it's You're not welcome. to understate the other, other sites. And one of the things that we're, we're going to look at now is because it is another report that came out recently. It's updated annually out of the Joint Center for Housing Studies at Harvard. It's the, um, yeah, you can go to it, Rachel. But I actually want to take the screen because I highlighted the report that I want to show here. So can I grab the screen, but it's, this link is in that um, secondary data set. It's a state of the nation's housing, and it's a 2018, uh, came out just recently. So I think I'm getting the screen maybe. You're the presenter. I think you have it now, Jamie. I think I just changed it to you. Okay. Yeah, great. So I'm gonna go into this. So in the in the state of the nation, there's all this is always the same uh, chapter uh, framings that they do every year, um, and there's the last one is the one that's most important to us. Executive summary is really good to go over, the, and the the last uh, chapter is on housing challenges. Um, and so we're going to flip the housing challenges because that's what um, uh, is includes the data that we want to look at for housing risk. And, uh, but the, in the executive summary, you could see already that there's incredible information um, that's available there. This is the, this report, what you wanna do, these are a very, very few pages. You wanna read this and pull out what you think is important to substantiate what is causing some of the homelessness in your own area. So it's really to create a background context in your story, in your data story, as to why there's increased risk in your own communities um, on both the cost burden, the household rent, renting, renting households. Um, and I just highlighted a few things that are just incredible, like jaw dropping incredible. So it helps it describe because many people think that federal housing assistance is taking care of it. Like what, what's, what's the problem? You know, there's, there's, uh, uh, public housing for people who need housing assistance or vouchers. And it describes here uh, in 2017, half, about half of assisted households received housing vouchers to use in the private market, which declined since 20, 2017, an actual decline. And that they, um, they give you actual numbers for the number of uh, uh, the decline also in public housing units. So, the limitations of assistance, the worst case housing needs report indicates that the number of very low-income households with severe cost burdens or living in inadequate or crowded conditions rose from 6 million in 2005 to 8.3 million in 2015. So the trends are going the wrong way. And then they, they give you backup data on the wait times that we know are real for our housing authorities and that they range from 18 months uh, for public housing to 32 months for vouchers. Many cities have a closer rating list. And then it talks also about how the voucher recipients are challenges to find housing within 60 to 120 days or surrender their voucher. Even when, given, even when giving extensions, as we know, voucher holders may have difficulty renting appropriate housing because landlords in many cities can refuse to accept vouchers. So you're laying out it with this uh, data report, it's helping you lay out some of the contextual story behind why housing risk is increasing. Uh, and in our high cost housing market, uh, how it's uh, even more intense. So the, what we all saw with our own AHAR is uptick in homelessness. So I actually put a box here. Uh, the summary here for me was uh, the most important. Uh, for a low income household, especially those spending a large share of their incomes on housing, an unexpected expense or job loss can lead to eviction. In fact, the vast majority of people experiencing homelessness are not chronically homelessness, homeless. And it gives you a percentage, 83% right there. And many who enter shelters, especially families, come directly from more stable housing situations. So you can put this on a slide, put this in a presentation, 
source it is a joint center for uh, Harvard's Joint Center for Housing Studies in the State of the Nation's Housing 2018 report. You give it credibility that way, um, but th these are facts as to why housing risk is increasing uh, as a framework. Uh, this is showing some of the high, co high cost metropolitan areas um, where homelessness is actually increasing um, in uh, New York, in Los Angeles, San Francisco, Seattle, and um, the outlook is not good. Just saying the outlook is not good. Uh, it's also pointing though, um, in the very last paragraph that's highlighted, it's pointing that the best place to start is to enhance and expand housing choice voucher, low-income housing tax credit programs, the essential pillars of the federal subsidy program, the home and CDPD programs also need additional funding. So this is advocacy focused also, but for us locally, there's ways to use this data uh, behind us. Uh, and that's, that's it for the chapter. So it will take you like 15 minutes to read and to highlight for yourself a context that you can use as you make the case uh, for why uh, homelessness may be increasing or why it ex even exists uh, in your own localities. Um, so this is here uh, for you from, the, from lots of ways to get to it, from the PowerPoint, secondary data sets. Um, and I wanna pass it over to our speaker who is here and uh, Ross, we're gonna give the PowerPoint now over to Jason. I've worked with Jason now for, I don't know, three, four years. And uh, Jason um, came from the HMIS directing, directorship world, went into the, um, uh, into the PhD realm to get more skills to bring back into the ending homelessness, ending housing crisis world. Uh, and we're really lucky to have him actually because he's, he's bringing both his statistical background his work in uh, Georgia with HMIS uh, for years in the state level uh, and, and researcher, uh, and more importantly, uh, the same mission, a shared mission to uh, preventing and homelessness that we all have, the drive. Um, so Jason, I'm gonna hand it over to you, and uh, here we go. Oh, thanks, Jamie, and it's, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be here today and, and, and to present on this topic. Um, just just a little more background on, on me, so I'm in the, um, I'm I'm a PhD student right now in in the Community Research and Action Program at, at at Vanderbilt University, and I I work on the research team of um and Dr. Beth Shin, who um studies homelessness and in particular family homelessness. So I've learned uh I've learned a lot from her and and from my program, and and I have um uh, my, uh, my master's is in applied statistics, so I bring that knowledge uh, to the table here too. So. Um, and and this actually comes out of um, an initiative that I uh, started when I was working for the state of Georgia, and 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 kind of picked up again when I started working with Jamie and and with Cloudburst. So, um, so so some of the so there were some some practical considerations that um, got me thinking about this topic. So, kind of the overarching question was how how can we make data driven uh, a, a project evaluation or system evaluation more uh, nuanced, informative, and fair. Uh, one one facet of that is how 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 can we avoid penalizing projects that serve higher need populations and and maybe as a result have um, lower outcomes. Um, we can also consider things in terms of like the change over time. Like if if a project's outcomes are trending downward, um, how do we know this is due to like whether this is due to worsening project performance or maybe to a change or fluctuation in in the clientele they're serving. So, for example, if they recently started to serve um, many more people experiencing chronic homelessness, then that might have something to do with uh, with their trend. And then, more more on a positive note, um, if if there are projects that are overperforming uh, with with higher need populations, how do we identify those and and um, and and then after that, learn uh, uh, learn from what they're doing and how they're having such good performance. So, <clears throat> so all of that is, um, uh, I think, can 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 be addressed with uh, with this topic. So, so really, this um, uh, the presentation is about um, really nailing down what what projects' expected performance outcomes are, and and that can help us interpret their. Uh, and the outcomes that we're observing, whether uh, I mean, uh, whether it's in, 
in HMIS or with some other data source. Um, so in this presentation, I'm going to describe the approach overall, um, and then I'm, and then I'm going to provide an example of 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 how I tested this approach using um, data from the Greater Richmond COC um, uh, about a month or two ago. All right, so let's let's start with what with what this is. <clears throat> so there are basically three steps here. Um, so first, I'm, I'm uh, for for each client, I'm uh, I'm estimating the likelihood of them experiencing a a, a certain outcome. Um, once I do that for um, for all the clients in a project, and then we average them, um, um, average these likelihoods to obtain the the expected outcome rate for the project, and then we compare this expected rate with the project's observed rate. Um, I'm going to um, spend a little more time here because this is the most complicated step um, with um, um, estimating likelihoods. So. Um, so, so my approach is like using HMIS data, uh, we can look for various um, client characteristics that are associated with a, a particular outcome. This may be uh, demographics, th this may be um, different income or um, 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 benefits data elements, this may be um, their shelter history, um, it can be a lot of different things. And um, some of these associations may be strong, others may be weak. And what this means is that certain uh, we we might want to weight certain client characteristics more uh, more heavily than others. So, uh, with this information, so we can look at a new client and look at their characteristics, and we can say, okay, well, this client, let's call him Bill. Um, uh, and people similar to Bill have have had these kinds of outcomes in the past. So, so maybe, um, like, like, uh, let's say maybe uh, among people similar to Bill, um, half had 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 had, um, had the outcome. So then we might expect Bill to have a fifty percent chance at having that outcome, um, based on um, on the past data that we're looking at. Um, and there there are different ways to um, uh, and to get this information. So one would be statistical modeling. Uh, Machine learning is another approach. Um, I'm going to focus here on um, statistical modeling. Um, so I'm going to give an example to um, I'm kind of illustrate this a, a little better. So uh, this is a fictional uh, um, provider. This is um, 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 every town shelter, and um, and and let's say we know from HMIS that that about half of every town shelter's clients had a stable exit from from homelessness. Um, and there's uh, there's a couple different ways to look at this percentage. One, um, just in absolute terms, we can compare this percentage to other uh, rates of other projects. And 50%, uh, it might be, uh, you know, it it might compare unfavorably to other projects. Maybe other projects have 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 a, have a 75% outcome. And maybe every town shelter doesn't look as good in that way. But if we think in relative terms, of, uh, relative to the clients they're serving, is is and fifty percent better than expected? Is it worse? Um, so it's hard to know without without further information. So um, so one way to answer this question is uh, is is to estimate the percentage of their clients that uh, should have a stable exit based on um, how how other similar clients have have performed, and then we. Um, and then we compare this expectation with the observed percentage. So um, here's an example of how we might uh, um, get the expected rate. So we would look at their clients. We would see, uh, you know, based on the characteristics of these different clients and some uh, statistical modeling in, in the background, we learned that, for example, John Doe has a 25% likelihood of a stable exit based on his characteristics. Um, maybe he's chronically homeless. And 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 that's why it's so low. Whereas Jane Smith is maybe not chronically homeless. She she has a forty percent likelihood of stable exit. Um, and um, in in actuality, most most projects are going to have more than four people. This is just for um, simplicity. But what we would want to do is we would take all those likelihoods and we, and we would average them together, and that would be the expected um, rate of stable exit for for the project. So based on 
on these likelihoods here, we would expect every town shelter to have a 25% rate of uh, stable exit from homelessness. And then uh, the idea is to look to see what actually happened. So um, in actuality, two of the four clients experienced stable exit, so half, um, um, half stably exited. That's much better than the 25% that we expected, and that's um, potentially useful information. Um, we can repeat this analysis for other projects, and we can represent it graphically like, um, um, like I have here. So this is um, and just a mock-up of what we maybe could see on, on a dashboard. Uh, each, each of the black dots represents a, a, a different project. Um, the, um, uh, so this, this axis here at the bottom represents um, how far away they fell from uh, what was expected. So if, you're, if your expected outcome rate was identical to your, to your observed outcome rate, you would fall right, right, right in the middle. Your, your deviation would be uh, zero, so you'd be right in the middle. Um, every town shelter had a deviation of, of, of 25 percentage points. So their observed rate was 25% uh, greater than their expected rate. So that's why they're way over here on, on the axis. And they kind of stand out as doing uh, much better than expected. Um, we uh, Conversely, we could consider an, an, another project over here who did a lot worse than expected. Um, uh, that, that might prompt further, further analysis, further in, in investigation in, into why they fall so far over there. Um, so this is one way to represent it. Uh, and another way would be through a uh, more more of a report format. So here, um, what I have mocked up is is um, is is a set of inputs where a, the user would input a, a, a report start and end date, would specify the subpopulation uh, and the outcome that they're interested in, and the and the project type. Um, and then a, a report would come out at at the bottom shown here, where uh, all the different projects are listed. They're, they're expected and their observed rates are listed, how, how far they deviated from expectation. And then a little more information about uh, some of the demographics of, of the program. So here we see every town shelter had a pretty low expected rate of um, stable housing. Um, and we look over here in NCO, they have a high rate of chronically homeless um, 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 individuals. That kind of gives us a clue as to why they had that expected rate. Um, I want to give a real life example about how how this can be useful. So, um, in in 2013, I was working on something similar, um, and I've I've refined this and uh, this approach since. But, um, but the uh, the, uh, the version that I was using then um, highlighted this uh, untransitional housing project in, in Marietta, Georgia, called uh, and, and the extension. And uh, the extension hadn't really previously stood out they were not um, they were not a project that we funded um, they had sort of a middle of the road um, rate of stable housing um, so so they didn't really stand out from from the pack but um, uh, by using this approach I learned that oh they they actually are doing much better than expected and I wanted to know why so I, I looked into it and and it turned out that they were serving an extremely difficult population, uh, men who are chronically homeless and had substance addictions. Um, and so this meant that their expected rate of housing stability was very low. And, and so in light of that, it was actually really impressive that they achieved an outcome on par with other uh, and transitional housing projects. Um, so our, our team, we thought this was really interesting. So we actually made a, we made a, we made a day trip out there one day and we spent a couple hours interviewing their um, their staff and their uh, some of their clientele to learn more about the project and uh, uh what they were doing and 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 it turned out that they were um a a, a pretty well-funded project and so they had a lot of money to uh, uh um provide uh, um to have some kind of innovative programming and so uh since our projects weren't as well funded um that that wasn't the most actionable information, but it was very illuminating as far as what strategies we could foresee in the future that um, untransitional housing programs might use. So this was a 
great way to learn about some some of the innovative methods that some of our projects were um, were in, engaging in when they were serving their uh, 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 their clients. So that uh, just to clarify, yeah. Jason, just to clarify. So sure. if um, uh, if so, you have a you, you use real data to model out what you expect they their return to homeless outcomes to be right based on mm -hmm. the type of class they're serving. And then if a housing provider does way better than expected, mm -hmm. uh, and then than expected, and they're serving a hard to serve population, it could be, hypothetically, it could be that they're actually doing really high fidelity housing first, right? Really high fidelity mm -hmm. housing stabilization. Like it's another kind of a oh, yeah. proxy for covering that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Uh, it, it can either, yeah, like it, it, it could be that they're doing something new entirely, or it could be that they're like having high fidelity to 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 a proven intervention, and, and so that can be, yeah, one. Uh, that can be one way of flagging that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and the then um, that flag, right? And you always in that follow up you did, you really want to go deeper always to do that. right. A yeah. Little interview or to go, you always want to dig deeper, but it's a flag to show you to go dig deeper. Right. right. Yeah. Because there's there's a lot of um, different reasons why um, projects may fall on the spectrum where where they do. And like so, if we look at this project way, way over here on the on the on the left, we may mm -hmm. jump to a conclusion that they're not um, they're they're just a poorly performing project. But you know, maybe upon further investigation, they're they're in a really unique a geographical area that is that doesn't have a lot of resources and so that might uh, be the explanation so yeah I, I think it's a, definitely a first step in a longer in investigation in in the program performance um, mm -hmm. right. yeah mm -hmm. um, so I want to share uh, so, so I tested this recently with um, data from Richmond Virginia and I want to share just to give you a sense of how um, how how this is implemented and how um, what we can expect as far as um, 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 how 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 accurate it can be. So um, uh, I want to be a little more specific about what what the outcome for this was. So by uh, stable exit from homelessness, I meant that a uh, client enrolled in a program, the client exited to some kind of non-homeless destination. There's a lot of different possibilities for that, and then the client did not enter an emergency shelter or street outreach program um, during the following year. And so if they satisfied those conditions, um, even if they went to like like a temporary housing condition, like like if they stay with friends temporarily, that, that could lead to something more, a, a more permanent. So as long as they satisfied these two uh, conditions, then I consider that a, a stable exit from homelessness. Um, just a little bit about how I prepared the data. So the and the program enrollments were um, and, and transitional housing or rapid rehousing enrollments. The, um, the the exit dates were between 2010 and 2017, and and so this data was was what was used to create the expected um, stable uh, stable housing rates. So I used um, so one thing that we struggle with sometimes with HMIS data is that there can be a lot of missing data and but um, Fortunately, there's, there's kind of a, a middle range where if it's like 20% missing or 25% missing, you can use um, statistical techniques to, um, um, to fill in that missing data. So that's what I did for, for a few of the data elements. I'm, I'm kind of rescued them for the model. And, um, and, and I split the data in, the, in, a, in a two different samples. One was households with children and one was households without children. And um, both of those samples had, had a pretty high number of enrollments. Um, so, uh, so the model had a lot of uh, uh, statistical power. Um, and so what I did for the analysis was I, um, for each household type, I split the enrollments in, into two different data sets. One was a, uh, what's called a training data set that you use to configure the statistical model. Um, and then after you configure it, you uh, a, you test the model on on an entirely separate data set. I'm a, I'm a test data set. So um, so I I created two models one one for households with children, one for households without children. 
um, I, I, I accounted for, you know, I mean, it's, 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 it's not just client characteristics that are associated with stable housing. It's, it's also various, um, uh, um, project related, um, um, characteristics for, so for example, were they in a rural County or, or an urban County and so on and so forth. So I, uh, I, I control for that project level clustering. And then, um, uh, and, and then the, like, after you configure the model, the question is, well, does it have, does it have high predictive power? And so that's what was tested on the, on, on the test data sets. Um, I, I tried a whole, whole bunch of different data elements as um, um, predictors. These were the ones that were um, statistically significant in the final models. Um, so this doesn't represent all that I tried, but, um, uh, and and I won't spend too much time here, but you can tell that um, certain certain predictors were predictive of um, stable housing uh, for uh, for households with children that were not predictive for households without children, and and vice versa. So that's why that's one reason why it's important to um, uh, make these predictions uh, separately for each household type. And they, you know, a, a lot of these were. Um, kind of the usual subjects like um, previous shelter entry, um, disabling condition, those weren't surprising. Um, but some were, uh, you know, we wouldn't necessarily have expected these in particular to be highlighted among the other data elements, like like having SNAP benefits or um, um, number of income types. Like they kind of make sense in retrospect, but um, yeah, so that, so these were, these were interesting. Um, and and so 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 another way of putting this is that these these were the predictors that ended up mattering for creating the expected outcome rates. Um, and these these were the results. So I wanted to show this uh, to give you a sense of how 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 accurate the and the models were because that is and that is pretty important. So I I want to break down this table real quick. So um, so this number twenty one means that. Um, it was it was predicted that the client would not have a stable exit, and it turned out that they in fact did not have a stable exit. Um, this three forty four says the same thing, but um, if if they did have a stable exit, then then that was correctly predicted. So we want we we want the numbers to be high in this diagonal here. Um, this diagonal here, sixty two and forty eight, those and those were the incorrect predictions. So we want that to be kind of lower. Um, and we also want them to be balanced. So we want, um, on, on average, we, we want these two boxes to be you know, roughly similar um, uh, because they kind of cancel each other out when, when you're kind of summarizing this all together. So um, if we were to um, summarize this uh, numerically, we'd say that 77% uh, of other clients were uh, um, collect, uh, um, correctly predicted in in the households without or, or in the households with children model, um, and because um, these incorrect predictions were relatively well balanced, the observed outcome rate was roughly equal to the predicted outcome rate, which is what we want. And uh, this correct predict the. Uh, this percentage here, seventy-seven percent, is you know it's not fantastic, but it's not too bad either. It's that's um, uh, kind of a kind of a moderately well predictive model. Um, households without children didn't didn't perform quite as good, but but still okay. Um, the uh, rate of correct predictions was sixty-eight percent, but um, again, uh, the incorrect predictions were fairly. Fair, unfairly balanced, and so the observed outcome rate uh, was not too much different from the uh, un, 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 the predicted outcome rate. So um, we we predicted that 60% of clients would um, have a stable exit from homelessness, and in fact, 65% uh, of them did. Um, we can uh, so if we do that at the project level, if uh, so each each of these rows is is a different project, and, and so we have uh, this column representing the project type, um, how many households exited, what the observed outcome rate was, uh, what the predicted outcome rate for the model was, and what what the deviation was. What was the difference between the observed and and the predicted? 
And um, I, just for um, for the sake of time, I'm just limiting this to households without children because because there were more uh, there were more projects for that um, for that subpopulation for um, families. There weren't as many projects, so this is I think a little more interesting. I, I'm, I'm just more of a spread. So so the way this is sorted is it's from highest to lowest on on this deviation column. So 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 the best performing projects are here at the top. So there was a transitional housing program uh, in Richmond that um, uh, performed 28 percentage points greater than expected. They had an extremely hard to serve um, um, population it, uh, and the predicted outcome rate was just 1%, but they had an observed outcome rate of, of, of 29%, which normally in absolute terms might might look kind of bad, but um, but in a way is still, still impressive. Um, all the way down over here, we have projects that were performing not as good as expected. So, um, so like some rapid rehousing programs uh, had an observed rate of 71%, but we had expected them to have a, a 92% um, success rate because they were serving relatively easy to serve clients. So this is one way that this can be drawn out. Um, another way, so this is kind of similar to that um, chart I showed earlier. Um, this is not a mock-up. This is something that um, came out of a uh, uh, statistical software. So this is a little more kind of a more realistic depiction of um, of uh, of these deviations. But here you have um, so so zero here is where uh, if if a, if a if a project was like performing right right at expectation, they would be right around zero. Um, if they were doing better than expected, and, and, they would be a, a, and they would be above zero and they would be colored green here. If they're doing worse than expected, then, then, then they would be red. So uh, on balance, the rapid rehousing programs that I, I looked at are um, doing a little worse than expected with, with some exceptions. The transitional housing programs are a little fewer and far between, but we have a uh, a few that are doing better than expected. And so, um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the next step might be to um, uh, look at some of these outliers and 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 investigate further, okay, why why are we seeing, uh, or why, oh, why are they an outlier? Why are they doing so good? Or oh, why are they doing so poorly? Um, and I wanna, uh, just conclude with some limitations because I think it's pretty important. Um, the uh, so as I shared, the, on the model's predictive power was 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 okay, but not great. Um, and I would I would guess that that would be that would be true in other in other COCs as well. I mean, HMIS uh, the different HMIS data that I've looked at, whether in Georgia or or in Richmond or in Orlando. I mean, they um, it's typically hard to have a lot of predictive power. Uh, for for some of these outcomes, um, but uh, so like I mentioned earlier, the uh, uh, the inc uh, the incorrect predictions were fairly well balanced. They were almost as 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 likely to be yes than no, um, and uh, and so as a result, the predicted overall outcome rate was fairly close to the to the observed overall outcome rate, uh, which is good. Um, uh, and that was true, kind of overall, like on on a system level. But um, but but um, but nevertheless, when you're when you're calculating these rates for different projects, this might not always hold true. And so, as a result, uh, some expected outcomes um, can be expected to be misleading. Though it's hard to know for which projects that'll be true. And um, so, what that means is that um, that these deviations from expectations should should be cautiously interpreted. Um, it shouldn't be seen as undefinitive, uh, um, but uh, like I, um, like we've mentioned a, a, a couple times, uh, it it could be seen as a flag that something unusual is uh, might be going on. Um, let's let's look further into it. So and 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 that could be a flag in a good way or in a bad way. Um, and that's that's basically. It. Are there any any questions?
Well, I wonder if people would see themselves applying this in their own localities, if anyone would see themselves um, using this model to really be a, a pointing, a, a way of looking, because you can't, you can't go into, you can't systematically investigate everybody, but you can actually follow up on where, where there might be um, some indication of um, poor performance, poor system performance, and a little bit of why. Um, but does anyone, would anyone see themselves um, thinking through applying this methodology? This is Dee in Salt Lake. Um, I've, I've been interested in this kind of analysis, but I always struggled to find out how, even once I got down and found out the information that I'm looking for, whatever the project results are, um, how I can use it in an actionable way for our, to improve outcomes. I mean, yes, we figure out which programs might be more or less successful, but is there a way to use this data directly to provide better services to clients? Or is it more academic so you can like make bigger picture decisions? Or what are your thoughts on that? Hey, tonight, I have a thought. Can I jump in? Is that okay? Sure. Yeah. You want to yeah, I have thoughts too, I'm sure. But the, um, the whole thing about how HUD requires everybody to say their housing first, everybody because that's, you get extra points uh, for housing first. Uh, and so how do we assess whether people, providers are actually uh, have any fidelity to housing first approach? One way could be to um, use this not alone, but again, as an indicator with uh, looking at expected outcomes in just uh, just permanent supportive housing or just for the chronically homeless population. Like you could target this in large uh, metropolitan areas. You could target this by the population type and then see the provider serving that population type and how they're doing by um, expected outcomes. And, and then you have to go to the next layer. The next layer is to discover how they are doing on real, in, in real terms, which is a housing first fidelity assessment kind of checklist of which there are many out there. I have some if you want any. But after that, it's actually um, embedded housing first training, weekly or, or monthly housing first uh, training calls that, that you really grow their staff capacities in vivo um, because you've, you've uncovered that there's a great need. So that would be an arc that I could see uh, this, this um, particular modeling working towards. Mm -hmm. Would that yeah. work, Jason? Yeah, and I'll just add to that, like, yeah, I, um, being able to identify um, um, best practices, you know, which could be an academic question, but it could also be um, a very practical question locally, um, especially if there are, for example, certain resources that a project is tapping that might be useful for other, for other projects. Um, another example I can think of is, uh, um, like I, I don't know, part of me, um, part of me hesitates to say that like this should inform like funding decisions. But I'm 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 thinking back to um, when I was working for the state of Georgia. Um, uh, we our our department was 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 required to make um, and data driven decisions um, about which. Um, which providers we funded and which we did not and and for for better or for worse that that had to be partly data driven um and so this was um we 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 incorporated this into our annual um, grant application um process because it was uh, it seemed more fair um to do it this way than to just simply compare um um, um programs outcome rates um and, and directly to each other without any other context. So I, I see this as like increasing uh, the fairness of that kind of evaluation. Okay, thank you. And I mean, D, if Jason was to like provide you with the methodology, could you apply it? Like, you know, the slides are here showing it, but if you had like a further, like, because you have a lot of data leadership skills there, could you see yourself applying it in that, like you said, you want to put it, you want to make it actionable. So all, each of those phases. But 
could you see yourself applying this methodology? Yeah, I think I think we could. We it would be interesting to maybe choose a selection. Uh, we have quite a few programs choosing a selection of those to maybe look at one of our chronic programs, one of our single programs, a family program, and see what the outcomes look like. And then, like you said, do a, a comparative uh, a comparison to what the outcomes for that program really are um, to see, you know, just really how it measures up based on the tool and how it really feels uh, in real life. Um, we, we being a provider, don't have the opportunity to use it as a scoring methodology, but as we continue to work on our internal improvement processes, it could definitely be a, a useful tool. Mm -hmm. And all this is, of course, based on having enough time to do so. <laughs> right. But, yeah. Any other thoughts? I know that the um, Richmond folks were excited about this and the um, there is talk about getting this onto a platform that could be an ongoing learning platform with the predictive modeling. Um, so that, you know, on the, on the call, we'll update folks if that happens, because that makes it quite accessible with data to just be able to look at it, utilize it and look at it. And the, Jason, you could t talk more about the predictive modeling aspect of it, just the machine learning over time, how it gets smarter. I find it's still mysterious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so the approach I shared was like a kind of a, uh, a one-off statistical model where where we at, at a certain point of time certain characteristics are related to the outcome in a particular way um, and then we just kind of use that information going forward um, the problem one limitation of that is um, those associations between characteristics and, and outcomes might change over time and so a machine learning approach would be to um, to have more of a uh, in, incorporate artificial intelligence into the um, a, a, the ongoing modification of of the underlying model, so that um, it's always kind of changing and up to date, and uh, um, and so that you you can be sure that um, your your expected outcome rates are as accurate as as possible. So the, yeah, those are two different approaches that I see. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's a lot of work and a lot uh, more to come. I know um, uh, uh, folks are excited to um, learn about advanced analytics and also don't, like Dee said, I think have time. You know, it's, a, it's this precious commodity to get everything done. Um, but in the last few minutes, is there, are there any other topics? We have a, um, one of the topics we're going to bring forward next month uh, is a piece of the, a, a piece of our uh, data work, database work, database decision making work, which is on the opposite end of advanced analytics. It's actually really using advanced listening skills for bringing our data outcomes uh, forward. So we're going to bring forward some um, tools and background and some uh, really applied practice uh, frameworks for you to be incorporating active listening tools in the stakeholder engagement uh, arc towards data driven decision making. So that's going to be very exciting, and we'll also have an update on a, another research output and also URL updates. But any other thoughts um, in the last few minutes of what other topics might be interesting for the community practice? Like, Dee, do you have anything burning there? I think one time, I think you said rapid rehab. No, I think you said coordinated entry evaluation. Could that have been you? Anyway. Some things we haven't been able to pull off, but um, do you have any burning topics? Anyone on the call? Hey, Jamie, this is Becky. I'm sorry I joined a little bit late, um, but it's always really cool to see Jason's tools and the things that he's um, been putting together. And you're right, in the Virginia area, we're definitely really excited um, to maybe hopefully start implementing some of this stuff. And something else we were excited about, you had mentioned um, a couple months ago, and I think it was something with somebody in Utah, but where they were, I think, pulling together uh, multiple databases into 
a single one outside of even the warehouse, the data warehouse that we have through the dashboard. Is that something um, that I'm remembering right, or could that be something we could talk more about at some point? Is that is that pulling together multiple databases into one into one data platform? Is that what that topic is? Yeah. What is that topic? Yeah. So we yeah. we had talked about um, a lot of our providers through all of their different funders and things like that I often have to input the same data elements into multiple systems and it just takes so long to, to like type in people's names and demographics into all of these different systems that they have to use for each of their funders and their reporting and I think you had mentioned somebody in Utah is doing some work around that um, and I've been meaning to circle back to that. Mm -hmm. Z, is that true? I mean that is actually true for I think uh, the there's a social service group, the two Karens in Utah, that put out RFP or something like that to have. Is this familiar, sounding familiar for Utah? Oh, uh, we've we've got a lot of discussions about that. The the Karens that you're speaking of, they're working on a. Uh, if it's the one I'm thinking of, it's a client-driven uh, data ownership project uh, in which the database would hold onto client information, but clients would themselves would have control over how that data is released to various organizations. So it's a different kind of project unless there's something else that I'm thinking of. But there are a lot of discussions about data warehousing primarily through the state to to put it together, of course, through all the, uh, the various fields, um, homelessness, criminal justice, um, mental health, medical, all those fields, of course, that we all would love to have data together. But I think we're we're not close enough as far as the data sharing agreements and the security and the privacy and all those considerations to really mm -hmm. say that we have something that's in progress. Mm -hmm. Our, our community is yeah. our, sorry. Our community is more focused mostly right now on developing. We're moving from a we're changing our homelessness provision system from a large shelter to multiple smaller facilities. So we have to implement coordinated entry uh, very specifically uh, with this new system. So there's a lot of things going on and uh, <laughs> concepts like that, you know, kind of get pushed behind when you have a massive community upheaval like we're going through right now. Right. Yeah, I hear you right. there, definitely. <clears throat> um, do you have, D, the, there's also a housing, a mobile app, uh, ma housing match framework that I know you were talking with uh, both Green River about and also um, uh, Mike Shore out of Texas, right? Is it Texas? Um, Michael Shore out of Phoenix. Uh, out of Phoenix, right, right, right. And both of the, I mean, the Michael Shore thing is great. He showed it to us on, uh, uh, he's a, a close co connection with Lassar, and he showed us what he was working on uh, to Lassar staff. But um, do you, do you think we should bring uh, that, bring Michael Shore's uh, housing piece? Are you going forward with that? Did you discern that that's a viable option? We are kind of in the discovery phase of that. We've uh, been having discussions with Michael about how to move forward with that, and we are looking to do kind of a demo with it with a, on a small scale uh, to roll out with some of our housing uh, locators and our housing navigation team to see how it really be effectively put into place. Um, so I don't know that we've, we're planning to adopt it fully, but we're definitely moving forward with the discovery. And we'll probably, if we do move forward, uh, implement it as an agency first, and then hopefully share that with the community. The housing app separately with uh, Green River is something that some initial work had been done through the, our county uh, providers. And we would love to bring that back to the forefront of discussions, but everybody's more focused on, again, the the system change, new resource centers, and the coordinated entry, which this housing app should definitely be part of, and we're trying to loop them back into that conversation, and they're still distracted at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you think we should bring Mike Shore's uh, presentation to this call for other sites? I think that'd be very interesting. Yeah, I'd love to hear other perspectives yeah. on it. It's, it's a very interesting uh, uh, tool, for sure. It's more landlord yeah. facing than client facing, like the uh, the Green River app would be, and uh, it right. seems like you've had some very good results with it. Yeah, and it's also very affordable. That's why I think, in, which makes it accessible. You know, again, um, so we'll do that. Basically, we have to um, rem we have to remember that we'll invite Mike Shore. It's a um, yeah, it's a it's a linking of the units that are available uh, in real time, I guess, 
to the to the coordinated entry system um, for, mm -hmm. for real real matching, uh, but it's automated. Something like that, right, Dee? That's what I remember. Uh, it gives landlords direct control over the listings and their units as they're available. So the landlords that he said that have that they've gotten good buy-in from landlords and those that are using it really really enjoy the uh, direct control over how their listing looks and um, how it gets kind of distributed. All right, so we'll do okay. that, and uh, we're over. But thank you, everyone. A good session and more to come. Yay. Okay, thank you, and thanks, Jason, very much for time yeah. and presentation. Yeah, sure. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.